And, and we're continuing um, on our evolutionary uh, approach to uh, scriptures and the Bible and the book of Genesis in reaching a conclusion or a determination about ourselves. Um, where we're at now is the, the story of Abram and Sarai. Remember, we identify these people. Abram is the spirit potential in each one of them. These people did not exist. I don't know how. I, I, I can't convince you that. I'll just say, well, I'm just telling you that, and you do whatever you want with it. The people in the Bible did not exist, and that's wonderful because then there's a purpose for this. If they existed, then you're reading about a, really a bunch of crazy people running loose that we're admiring all over the place who did horrendous things like, you know, sitting in the intestines of a fish for three days until he puked and, you know, then you got your credentials to preach. I mean, that type of stuff. So, you know, or else we have a, uh, uh, people in the garden talking to a snake and he tells them that they don't have any clothes on. And, and you know, this becomes our religion. Uh, and, and then we think, you know, other people are pagans. But beyond that, here this is the spirit potential within you. Now, what's going to happen to this this person, Abram, is when he achieves that potential, he will receive the letter H in his name. And the letter H, if you look it up in the alphabet, means aspirate, which means breath, okay? So when he receives breath or spirit breath from within himself, the Abram becomes Abraham. His wife is Sarai. And the wife in mysticism and metaphysics means the emotions, okay? But when she gets to that point, now don't forget, she didn't exist. She is in here. She's you. When she reaches that point where the emotions then become virgin, when they are separated from the thoughts and they become virgin consciousness, she will receive the H in her name and Sarai will become Sarah. And then in that barren state, which is virgin consciousness, she will give birth to the child. So this is our spirit potential of the mind, Abram. And Abram is two ancient Hindu words. The Ab is father. Aram is that which is the spirit breath. Okay, that's why it's Abram. So it's spirit father, which then will manifest itself within us through that which is our emotions being converted into a spiritual aspect of, you know, virgin consciousness, which is Sarai becoming Sara. Okay. In addition, in this story, we had Lot, which was the conflicting part. This is the uh, cousin, nephew of Abram, and Lot is the desire uh, to live in Sodom, which is the lower part. Doesn't mean you want to have sex, everybody does. It doesn't mean you want to drink, everybody does it to a certain extent. Doesn't mean you want to smoke, you want to go to Atlantic City. It has nothing to do with it. It talks about developing a desire to run your show instead of allowing that which is the spirit potential of the right hemisphere of the brain to run the show. So Lot is the desire to live in the lower, Abram is the desire to live in the higher, and the two present a conflict to each other. We, we get to a really beautiful part here, and you'll see the evolution of this, because if you remember, uh, as we began in Genesis, we had the conflict between Adam and Eve, who obviously did not exist, it's our part of our uh, physical and mental. Adam and Eve and the serpent, and the serpent won. Okay. Then we had the conflict between Cain and Abel, which was the same thing, the left side and the right side, and Cain won. But now we get into a whole new situation here. And we're going to introduce to two new characters as we continue. And these characters just are items which are representative of parts of your mind. We get introduced to the king of Sodom. And we get introduced to Melchizedek. Okay. And these are two new aspects of the mind, and, and you'll see the development because for the first time since we started off in Genesis in this evolution of the mind and, and the brain and the consciousness, uh, the Abram or the spirit potential inside of us will overcome that which is the left side. All right? Now, let's, let's look at that. If you go to page, um, what page is this on? Genesis 14, page 11, I think. Page 11 in the Bible. And then you'll see, uh, you'll see this for yourself, and then, and, and then you try to, try to kind of put it together with the way you feel. Now, so we got, we got to that part. Let's take a look at what happens. And in the first time, where after the serpent had overcome Adam and Eve, the left side had won, the right side had lost. Cain had overcome Abel, the left side had run, the right side had lost. Here's a situation in Genesis chapter 14. The word Damascus means activity. Okay. 
The word Damascus means activity, where things are going on. Now, here we'll see Abram, which is the spirit potential within you, overcomes the left side. For the first time, you're able to deal with that thing that is gnawing inside of you. Here we had this O.J. Simpson, Simpson thing. The left side won big time within him, overcame him completely, and the destruction that came out of that, well, you, obviously. Now, this is what is being said here. You say, oh, that's a terrible thing, and indeed it is a terrible thing. But it's nothing compared to on the left side of, of people in corporations destroy people who work for them, uh, people in governments who drop bombs on other people and kill them by the millions. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's the activity of Damascus. It's activity. And where is it that Abram overcomes? And this is the beautiful part. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, where you are, he divided himself against them. He and his servants by night smote them and pursued them unto Hobart, which is on the left hand of Damascus. In other words, he overcame, he won the struggle, okay, which is at the point of the left side. The activity of the left side he overcome. That's the first victory that, and the evolution of the potential of the mind, the first victory that the right side, Abram, has had over the left side. And in this particular set, it says he overcomes this which is at the left side. And that's, that's where we pick this up. Because through Genesis, we've seen Adam and Eve get kicked out of the garden, which means we have no longer control in the right hemisphere of the brain. We're now dwelling in the left hemisphere of the brain where all of the crap comes from, where all of the hurt comes from, when all of we fight with one another, and we scream at one another, and we beat one another up, and we drop bombs on one another, and we rape one another, and we molest one another. We do all of these things. It's the left side wins constantly. And here's the first signal that that doesn't have to be that way. He overcomes the activity of the left side. That's the first time in the Bible. Say. And, and, and then we see something that really is beautiful that takes place here. Uh, after he overcomes the activity of the left side, okay, remember something. When he has overcome this activity, it says in Genesis 14, verse 17, the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Here's where we're introduced into the king of Sodom. The king of Sodom is your ego. You've been coming, you've been doing meditating, like Jackie Kennedy or whoever it is. You've been doing this meditation. You, you've been struggling within yourself to overcome that left side, which will cause you to, to self-destruct. And then finally you have a confrontation now with your own ego. You have a confrontation, which is, which is the left side. You have a confrontation going on within yourself. You decided yourself, you're not going to allow yourself to be destroyed. You're not going to allow your children to be destroyed. You're not going to allow your family to be destroyed. You finally discovered that the destruction that comes to your family and to yourself all emanates from within your very own mind. You're going to find out what this is all about. You're going to strike that part within yourself that can lift you above all of this and your ego now will come against you and start attacking you but here is something different remember Abram has overcome the activity of the left side so that which is the king of the left side represented by the name king of Sodom comes out to cut a deal hey I'll make a deal with you I'll make a deal with you and what does it say it says in 14 Genesis 14 where you are 21, the king of Sodom said, give me the persons and take the goods yourself. In other words, what's, what's being said here is Abram went in, they had a battle. This is the allegorical part of this story, the, myth, the, the symbolic stuff. Abram won. He, he, he captured the people and, and he took all of the material goods. But that's, that, this is the story. It's an allegory. Now the king of Sodom says, look, I'll make a deal with you. You give me the people, you can take all the material things for yourself. You know what's been said there? The left side of your brain is saying, you stick with me and you'll be rich. You give me yourself and all of those material things that you want, you'll get. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? And you know, generally, that's where we've come. We've come this far. We have come this far as a human race in our evolutionary trip towards self-destruction because we said, that's a deal. That's a deal. Slip it to me. But there is an interesting thing here. Look at Genesis chapter 14, where you are. Look at verse 23. Abraham said, I will not take a thread. You see it? You know what he just said? 
I'll not take one thought. Hey, I'll not take one thought. This is the process. I have defeated the left side. I've overcome the left side. Now the deal is being struck. I'm starting to get thoughts in my mind, you know. Hey, wait a minute. You know, you're getting all goofed up in this thing. Here, if you'll just give me this left side, give me yourself, you'll get all of this stuff. You know what that means? Oh, I'm going to figure my way out of this. You know, I'll, 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 I'll figure out how to do this. I'll, I'll get a checkbook. I'll get a new job. I'll get all of these things. I'll do all of these things. I'll figure out how and make all of this stuff comes out because your mind is saying to you, do it my way. Do it my way. But here, a Abram says, I'm not going to give you one thread. And when you come in and you sit in meditation and you om or you meow or whatever, you raise yourself up, you have shut down the king of Sodom, which is the left hemisphere of your brain, is screaming, don't do that. Give yourself back to me. If you want to be successful, you got to go to college. If you want to be successful, you got to get a job. If you want to be successful, you got to do this. You got to join Little League. You got to be just like your daddy or you'll never have a psychiatrist like I have. How are you ever going to afford these things unless you're like dad? So what do we do? We all play the king of Sodom. So we take the little kids. They don't know anything. We teach them. We teach them things from God's holy word. The Bible. And what do we teach them? The devil's going to get you. You do that, you're going to go to hell. Until I used to think and there was something laying under my bed or I closed the door and I would see somebody had a coat hanging on a wall that I didn't see but it looked like a monster. Who put that in my head? But we got better ways nowadays to really put kids in a complete nervous breakdown. We get them in a little league. Oh, here, all of us, all of us dads will come down and we'll oversee everything. And I'll tell you, if they don't treat you right, I'll knock the hell out of them, so don't worry, you know? And we get them in Joe's Tire Store, gives you a uniform, and little Irving is in the center field, and Irv, catch the ball. Don't disappoint the family. And whatever you do, don't disappoint Joe's Tire Store. And the ball gets hit to center field, and there's little Irv going around like that. Where is it, where is it? And the ball comes down and hits little Irv in the head. And Dad is standing out there, you're, you're a disgrace. Do you know how much Irv paid for these shirts? Look what you've done. You've got a seven-year-old kid on a guilt trip. You've taught him to be just like us. They're nuts, they're guilty, they're filled with all kinds of suicidal thoughts because we said, hey, You've disgraced. Why don't you walk home? Don't drive home with me. I've seen that. When they make the kid walk home, you're not going to drive home with me. And mom, huh? Eh. So then we go on. The kid now is a, is a half of a neurotic, and we're going to just make it complete. Let's send him to Princeton. You're going to be a lawyer. You're going to be a doctor. You're going to get all A's. And so you're going to be, so you can su afford a psychiatrist just like your dad has. And the kid goes to Princeton and works his way right up to the top, right up to the roof of the building where he jumps. And you think that's not true? It's true. Teenage suicide is the second leading killer of teenagers in the United States. Why? Because of all the crap that we've poured on them. You can't afford to allow children to be children anymore. You've got to go down and supervise them and organize them and show them how to compete and beat the hell out of one another. And then you come and your pay time comes. Someday, pay time comes. And in this particular case, Here's our Brahm, and this is you saying, I don't want any of it. But do you see what happened here? The left side saying, I need you. Don't let, don't, don't let yourself be taken in, going off to the right side. I need you. You give me yourself, I'll give you all these things. That story should be familiar to you. Go with me to page 779. And I'll show you the exact same story dressed up with a different, uh, little different title to it and a little different thing, but it's the exact same story, okay? Page 779, if you look at Matthew chapter 4, and look at verse 8, and here's the devil and Jesus, it's the same story. And the devil takes Jesus up into a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world, and says, I'll give you all of this if you'll just fall down and worship me. In other words, give me yourself and you can have anything you want. And Jesus says, stick it. 
and Abram says, I won't take a thread. It's the same story. It's saying that everything you've been taught, everything you've taught your kids, everything you've instructed in your traditions has led this earth to the point, to the brink of absolute self, total annihilation and destruction. It is wrong. And the way that you have to learn is to retrace your steps and bring yourself and your children to the point of realizing that the potential is within them. The potential is within them to be God. The potential is within them to be the devil. Whatever you want to call it, but it's all inside. The Lord Christ tried to tell everybody the kingdom of God is within you. But we've conducted and constructed religions and have separated and divided people and pointed guilt and hell and all of these types of fingers at people. And we've brought nothing but total insanity to the earth. And this is our traditional life, the good old boys. This is the way we're going to go on. And so here we see the same thing. Don't you see it? The devil says to Jesus, give me yourself and you can have all of this stuff. The king of Sodom says to, to Abram, hey, give me, your, give me the people and you can take all the material thing. But I'll tell you something. Forget about the king of Sodom. Forget about the devil and Jesus. You've heard this guy talking to you all week long, every day of your life. The same message comes in. Give me yourself. Start listening to me. Think of this. You've never, ever even been told about the one who dwells at the right side. That which is the meditational process. You've never even been told. But now here's the point that it gets good. So the inner part of you says, no way. No way. I'm going to find out who I am. I'm going to find out about that 90% of my mind which is inactive. I'm going to find out what will happen if I start activating it. I want to change in the earth. I want to change in my family. I want to change in myself. I want to change for the kids. I want to change for the universe. I want to change for the animals. I want to change for all that is natural. It has been bad. It has been violent. It has been destructive. And I want it to be right. And I want to grab hands with everything that lives. And I don't want anybody telling me that I can't touch. I don't want anybody telling me that I can't be part of everything that goes on in this universe. I want to be part of it. And so Abram makes a decision. And this is the decision that's so beautiful. Look at Genesis chapter 14. It's on page 11, is it? And look at verse 20. It says, that here Abram decides, after he is the blessed by the Most High, he decides to give tithes of all. Do you know what has happened here? Abram has made a commitment, I'm going to give 10%. 10%. I'm going to give it. Do you see what's happened? Do you remember last week Abram was with Lot, and Lot was with a conflict like Cain and Abel? And God couldn't speak to Abram until Lot left. And when Lot left, then God spoke to Abram. And then Abram overcame the left side. And then the ego comes up against us and says, give me yourself. And Abram says, no way. I'm going to give 10%. Do you know what he just said? Not 10% of his money. Not 10% of the things that he owns. I'm going to give the left side of myself. I'm going to give that which is myself. I pledge to give that which is the left hemisphere of my brain. I am going to give that in meditation. And when that shuts down, I will open up the right side. I will open up the Garden of Eden. I will open up Nirvana. I'm giving 10%. And look what happens when he gives 10%. Look what happens when he pledges to give 10%. Look what happens when you pledge to give 10%. Look at Genesis chapter 14. Okay? And look at verse uh, 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High. Look who appears. I'm going to give 10%. Melchizedek brought bread and wine. Bread is the truth. Wine is the spirit of the right hemisphere of the brain. The high priest is that which enters into the right side which is the holy place, the holy of holies. And so when you have dedicated yourself to giving 10%, when you have dedicated to yourself, when you have decided you will overcome by going deep into that which is the recesses of your mind and shutting down the left hemisphere of the brain, then Melchizedek shows up. There's an electrical impulse. All of these people, they don't exist. There's nobody running around inside of your head. There's no little people in there. These are all electrical impulses. And all these are stories as how to activate the different impulses in the same way that you'll tell somebody how to operate a computer. If you will learn how to activate the 
impulses with inside of you. All of this was happened. When you have decided to shut down the left side, it starts to energize the right side, that which is the spiritual side, that what you want to call the natural side, that which is the God side. And then there is bread and wine. There is truth and there is spirit and there is understanding and you are lifted up and you are motivated and you start to rise above all of the violence and all of that hurt which has encompassed us in all of the days that this earth has been alive. See, bread and wine was not new with Jesus and all this kind of business. That actually, in, in the mythology of it, it started with Osiris. When Os Osiris was buried, he came up as the grain. He, he, he came up as the grain in the field. And they would take the grain of the field of the wheat and they would make bread and wine. Excuse me, they would make bread and beer. They didn't make wine. Bread and beer they made long, long time ago. Yes, that's where it first came from. The cult of Osiris, they took that which was the grain that grew out of the ground, and they made bread, and they made beer, and it became the body and blood of Osiris, and it became the bread and wine. And then when the culture moved to Greece, there appeared the god Dionysius, and it was changed from bread and beer to bread and wine. Okay, And it means truth and spirit. And so here, what has happened? Do you see the evolution? What's happened? All of a sudden, we had the serpent overcoming Adam and Eve. We had Cain and Abel, Cain overcoming Abel. And here, for the very first time, Abram overcomes the left side. The ego comes out and says, don't do this. Give yourself to me, and you can have all of these physical things. Abram, that which is within inside of you, says, I will not take a threat. I will not take a thought. I'm going all the way with this. I'm going to give the 10%. I'm going to give my left side in meditation. And then suddenly, when you decide to give your left side in meditation, Melchizedek comes. The high priest opens the temple, which is at the right hemisphere, the right side. And there is the flowing of the bread and wine. There is the flowing of the truth and the understanding and the spirit and it all happens through electrical impulses inside of your head and what's wrong with that it happens naturally and it doesn't cost you anything you don't have to join anything you can sit on the john and do this it doesn't require you to be in any special costume or to sing any special songs as you heard this morning you can do whatever you want to do any way you want to do it but the point is you've got to be willing to make a decision am i going to plug into the left side or am i going to open the door to the right side hey look. let me show you something this is people some people that haven't been here somebody yell out to me and tell me what page 1 Kings is on in your Bible? I want to show people that haven't seen this before. Just tell me what page 1 Kings is on. 1 Kings chapter 6. Tell me what page it's on. 290. Would you, would you, show, would you look in that and, and I'll show you something and look at that. Page 290. Chapter 6 is 296. All right, 296, okay. This is the construction of the temple. Remember, it says God lives in a temple not built with human hands. The only temple that exists in the universe that is not built with human hands is right here. Right here. That's the temple being discussed. Let me show you the temple, the construction of the temple in metaphysical symbolic terms. Okay? 1 Kings chapter 6, um, verse 7. The house, when it was building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought, so there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard while it was building. The construction of the temple is in silence. Meditation. Okay? Now, the second part of it, and I want to show you the door. Verse 8, the door for the middle chamber. The middle chamber is the holy place, was in the right side of the house and they went up with winding stairs. The winding stairs is the electrical energy that rises up the spine. It's called Kundalini in Hindu terms. It's an electrical energy that uses the life force which goes up the spine. They went up winding stairs into the middle chamber which is the right hemisphere of the brain and out of the middle into the third. That's the third heaven. When the Apostle Paul said he had an out-of-body experience that was caught up into the third heaven, he was introducing this very same thing. Okay, So there's where we've got it. So Okay, so Abram gets to this point. Now, here is what I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you. First of all, in two things, and there's some people that haven't 
been here before and they say well you know this guy's making up all this stuff you know that's not what it says in there where the heck does he get the right to say these things okay the first thing is I study metaphysics and I've been doing it for a long time and I understand the symbolic nature of words in the same way that if I say to you let's go shoot the bull I would hope that you would not have to get a gun or go looking for a black animal I would hope that you would know we're just gonna have a conversation in the same way if I say this gentleman shot his mouth off it would not be necessary to call the police or the first aid squad that it's simply saying he told talked out of turn. In the same way, if I say this young lady spilled the beans, we're not going to debate whether they're pinto beans or refried beans or lima beans. We know that she spoke out of turn. It's three sheets to the wind. It's green with envy. You know that he's just a green kid. Well, you know, not really. Okay, we're talking about symbolisms that we speak all the time. In referencing this in the Bible, in Psalm 78 too, it says God speaks in parables. In Proverbs 1, 6, it says, Wisdom is understanding the dark sayings. Shoot the bull is a dark saying. It does not mean what it says. Okay? Mark 4, 11 says, Jesus never taught but in a parable. The one I wanted to show you about this is where we're at right now, is the Abram, Sarai, Abraham type of stuff. I want to show you documentation that gives me license to do this because I have no right to stand up here and tell people things unless I can show you and document for you where I get the authority to do this, okay? Let me show you where it comes from. Somebody, uh, go to, well not somebody, go to page 953 in those Bibles. And if you would, look in Galatians chapter 4 and page 953, Galatians chapter 4 and look at verse 22. It is written, Abraham had two sons and that's what we're talking about now. Verse 23, he who was of the bond woman was born after the flesh, he of the free woman was by promise. The next thing I want you to see is what is in verse 24. Which things are in allegory? I, do you see it in the Bible? Do you see it? I mean, it's there. That's the authority that I have to say this did not happen. That's the authority that I have to say this is a symbolic story. And then you can start using the metaphysical symbols to understand what was being said here. The Bible says it is an allegory. It is documented so that I have a right then to proceed on the allegorical nature of the text. Otherwise, I, it's just an opinion. It's not an opinion. It says so right in here. Okay? And so then when we get to that point, we look at this and say allegorically what is being said here and we see the evolution of you. And where did we all start? We started right in the very first page of the Bible with that which was atom. Okay? We took a rib out of the atom, meaning we split the atom and we multiplied the energy. We introduced Eve, was the introduction of thought. We introduced the serpent, which is the introduction of contradictory thought. We developed that, which was conflict through Cain and Abel. We moved into the left hemisphere of the brain when we, lost, we left the Garden of Eden. And now we have moved into this strange story of Abram, where we start to see evolutionary how we start to overcome the left side. And how do we start to overcome the left side? The first thing that Abram had to do was get rid of Lot because Lot wanted to live in Sodom. That's the part of us. We have to make up our mind that we don't want this inside of us, that we're going to direct ourselves to the right hemisphere. Lot is gone. God talks to Abram. Abram overcomes the left side. The king of Sodom, the ego, comes out and says, Hey, look, it, uh, give me yourself. I'll give you this stuff. And Abram says, Take a hike. And then all of a sudden Melchizedek appears, which means an impulse starts pulsating within us that opens the door to the right hemisphere of the brain, brings the bread and wine, which means brings the truth and brings spiritual understanding, and we're starting to move away from all of the crap that we've been immersed in and starting to head towards the right hemisphere, starting to head to the eastern place within inside of us, starting to head to the 90% of the brain within inside of us, which is dormant, because all of us, no matter how smart we are, are 90% ignorant because the right side is not functioning under our command. And why isn't it? Because we've chosen to live with the left side. We've chosen to say to the king of Sodom, yeah, I know what you're talking about. I'll take this. <clears throat> I wanted to show you kind of quickly just some documentation about this thing of tithing. Because the thing of tithing has been used by religious organizations to take 10% of people's money out of their pockets. I'm sure they didn't do it intentionally. In some cases they have, and that you know, depends on the person. But for the most part, they have misinterpreted this and they have decided to take 10% of money. They say you give it to the church. Let me just show you something uh, that I think is interesting and, and, and kind of takes away from that. Uh, I'll probably have to find it someplace else. Uh, 
Yeah, well, yeah, okay. If you look on page 24 of your Bible, Genesis chapter 28, here's a point where there's a guy out in the desert. There's no such thing as a church. There's no such thing as religion. Uh, he's all by himself. All he's got is a rock and uh, some sand. And his name is Jacob, and it says in Genesis chapter 28, if you look at that, Jacob, Genesis chapter 28, page 24, verse 22. And he says, And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that shall give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Who's he going to give? Ten percent of what? The rock he's got there? Who's he gonna, what church is he going to give it to in the middle of the Arabian desert? Uh, ding dong, where's the church? Is Jerry Falwell? No, I shouldn't say this. I'm going to get uh, uh, <laughs> Who's got their hands out? Nobody. What does it mean? Ah, uh, you're giving me all of this? You're giving me that which is from the right side? I'll give the tenth. I'll give that which is the left side. I'll give myself. That's what's said. Okay. Now, if we can quickly look at this, I will show you about this Melchizedek because I've got to show you that tithing is not giving 10% of your money. If you want to give 10% here, I don't think you should. You should give 20. <laughs> no. You, now, that, see, that sounds fair because there are people going to be sitting there, but you know that those of you who have come here for years, nobody's ever said to give a dime. And for the most part, you've been true to that. You haven't. You know? <laughs> It's a struggle. It is a struggle to pay veto, but we, we're able to do that. We don't, you know, you've been faithful. I said, don't tithe, and you, you obey. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Let, <laughs> let me show you something. And, and once again, remember, I'm not here to get anybody to believe in anything. I'm only asking you to think. If the stuff starts making sense, start looking at it yourself. Get books on it yourself. Study it yourself. I'll be glad to sit and talk with you. But I can only give you ideas that propel you on. The only thing that I've always tried to do is document where I get this stuff from so that you can see for yourself. The Apostle Paul, whoever or whatever he was, devoted a whole chapter of the Bible to tell people, don't give 10% of your money to the church. It's in the book. Okay? And if we could quickly just look at that and then we can go on. I just, I just wanted to show you, if you go to page 980 in the Bible and you'll come up to Hebrews chapter 7, okay? First of all, there is a description of this Melchizedek which proves that we're not talking about a human being, okay? We're not talking about a human being. We are talking about an electrical impulse inside of your brain that receives the name of Melchizedek. Don't you see? Look, when you flip the switch on that particular impulse, it acts in a way that it starts to activate the right side. You start to understand things you didn't understand before. You start to rationalize things spiritually. So they put that little switch and they title it Melchizedek. Okay? That's all this is. There's another switch inside of you that when you activate it, you get in all kinds of trouble. You start screwing up everything. You start, you, you know, you get this and say, well, geez, I didn't know it was going to turn out like this. I really screwed that up. When you flip that switch, it's called the king of Sodom. It's called Cain. It's called the serpent, whatever you want. But when you touch that switch, you start an electrical impulse. They just put names on all of these different impulses inside of your brain. The wall, it's all electricity. There's none of these people in there. Are you surprised to hear that? There's no people in your head. Isn't that good? And, and many of us, there's a lot less than even that in there. But anyhow, there's, a, there's, no, there's nobody in there. And, but there are a whole mass of wires and electrical things going in there. And it says that when you touch them, you activate them, different things happen. You do different things. If you start thinking sexually, and some of you have been known to do that. If you start thinking sexually, you know what happens? Immediately your body starts triggering different things into your body. What do they call them? I would know. Uh, what are they? Hormones start triggering into your body, and different things happen, as you know. How? Because you started thinking this way. So whatever you think, your body reacts immediately. Start thinking sexy. I'll wait for a minute. <laughs> and you know it, and you probably have done it before. <laughs> but I mean, what happens? As soon as the thought comes in, you start entertaining the thought, the body kicks in and starts doing things. The flight or fight syndrome is another thing. You got to freak out, your body instantly triggers and it rushes blood and tells your blood to coagulate faster, anticipating that you're going to get a cut. All of it. So then what happens if you start thinking this way? What happens if you start thinking to the right side? Your body triggers in and things start to happen. You flip the switch. 
you flip the Abraham switch. And then one day the Abraham switch turns into the Abraham. You become the father of many nations, which means you become the director of those which are the divine thoughts on the right side. Real quick, I just wanted to show you, so we identify this Melchizedek is not a person, but is an aspect inside of your mind. If you look at page 980, look at Hebrews chapter 3. Who was this Melchizedek? Chapter 7. Okay, see verse 1 for this Melchizedek. Okay, verse 2, to whom Abraham gave a tenth. Okay, what was he? Verse 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning nor end, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. What is it? Has no father, has no mother, has no heritage, has no beginning, has no ending. It is universal consciousness. That's what Melchizedek means. And it dwells inside of you, waiting for you to decide to give a tenth. And that, as you know, means that waiting inside for you to give the left hemisphere, give that left side. Okay, and look at verse 4. Consider how great and different he was. Okay, now this is the interesting part. Look at verse 5, and this is what I want to show you. They that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of a priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law. Okay, so in other words, Levites in the Bible are religious people. They're priests and they're ministers and evangelists and the people that you see today. Those were the ones who had the law to say to take tithes, okay? But look what it says in verse 6. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham. In other words, he didn't give it to any priest. He didn't give it to any evangelist. He didn't give it to any pope. He didn't give it to any minister. Who did he give it to? He gave it to something that did not exist in the physical realm. And that's exactly what Paul says. It was not to a priest that he gave this. See? Look what it says in verse 8 then. He, here men that die receives tithes. In other words, you're given 10%. It says you're given 10% to people that croak. They're no better off than you are. You know? You're given 10% of people that have got the same hang-ups that you do. And some of them are a lot worse. And that's what Paul's trying to say in the Bible. Here, men that die receive tithes, but there he received them of whom it is witnessed. He lives. I mean, this lives. This is where the tithes go. Tithing is to a universal concept inside of you. What I'm showing you is the comments of Paul. I'm not saying this. I'm reading it out of the Bible. Paul says, you're giving money to human beings, but then, though, it's not. It's 10% that's given to the universal energy. Okay. Now look what it says in verse 11. Then if therefore perfection were by the priests or the ministers, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek? So what the heck do you need? If you can get perfection by going to church, if you can get perfection by giving money to churches, then what's the sense of all this? What's the sense of needing a Christ? Why did a Christ die? What's the sense of all of this? It can't come that way. So what's the conclusion? And this is the interesting part. What the conclusion is, is that the priesthood changes from the church, which is the outer law, to the Christ, which is an impulse within you, beating, beating, wait, throbbing, waiting for you to discover it and allow it to be born through the virgin mind, through the virgin consciousness. Okay? So then it says in Hebrews 7, look at verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there's a need also to change the law. See that? You know, there's got to be, you had this law of tithing, you've given 10% of the money, but now it's just, no, you've got to change this. See? And then what it says is, in, uh, in verse 16, uh, verse 15 and 16, it is far more evident that after the similitude, in other words, the same thing of Melchizedek, there rises another priest who is not made after the law of a carnal commandment. Do you see what he just said? This is what he just said. You know what he just said? He said that Jesus is not human. Do you see what he just said? He said Jesus is Melchizedek. It's an energy. It's a force. It's good. It's healing. It's inside of you. It's not a person. It's not a human being that can live. It's not a human being that can die. It's not a human being that was born. It's not a human being that has parents. It's not a human being that has ancestry of any kind. And this has arisen after Melchizedek. There is another now. There is this Christ with inside of us. See? And so then what about this law of tithing, of giving 10% of the money? Guess what it says? Look at verse 18. For there is a verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. In other words, stop it. 
stop giving 10% to people and give the 10% which is your inner being to the Christ who dwells within you. I don't know how it could be any clearer. The man said it. The Bible, what, what do we say when we say these crazy things that people never heard before? How do I know? Come on. The Bible oh, tells me so. Terrible singers, but you, you want, <laughs> do you, do you see, I would beg you, do you see why I say this? Because it's in the book. It isn't the New Age Journal. It's a Bible, Bible. It says right on the Bible. <laughs> King James Bible. And it says right on it. What did the man say? Don't do it anymore. Understand what tithing is. You're giving money to people that are dropping dead all over the place. You don't do that. There is another who has come after Melchizedek, who is also not human, who is also a wonder of energy, of light within inside of yourself. Give that 10% there. That's what he said. There is a dissonance because it is not necessary and it accomplishes nothing because the law made nothing perfect. Okay? And I'll tell you something. What did it say Melchizedek was? He was like the Son of God, a priest abideth forever. And look, at this is interesting. Look at Hebrews chapter 7. Look at verse 21, okay? For those priests were made without an oath, but this without an oath. The Lord swear when I, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. But look, what you know what he just said? Jesus was not first. He was after the order of Melchizedek. He wasn't God's only begotten son. See, that's why the Bible says now we are all sons once we allow the Christ within us to live. And so that's, that's the problem. The last thing that as we, we just move to Genesis 15, 14, uh, Genesis 15, 4, the promise comes, and I just wanted to cover that, and I know it's late and I don't want to do it, but the promise comes in which the promise is made of the child being born, and the child is born within you, the son is born within you, it says from your bowels, in other words, it happens within inside of your own consciousness. Okay, so we've reached this point in our journey and uh, the evolution of understanding of this that you realize now that as you start to come to grips with the left side and do not accept which comes from the left side and how do you do that just simply meditation 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 that's all you have to do find your meditation with inside of yourself and you energize this right side and then Melchizedek appears the bread and wine flows the door to the right side is open and then the next thing as we go along in our study in the in the evolution we'll find we'll come to the point of circumcision and the circumcision is when we have cut away all of the outer desire all of the outer desire and then we become free Okay. And it doesn't mean that you cut away desire for things. I love Jimmy Buffett. I love to go to Atlantic City. I love the chocolate cake and do all of this crazy stuff and everybody. And you don't give up any of that stuff. You get more and more and more of it. You have fun. You know why? Because you do it without any guilt. You just have fun and enjoy yourself. And you don't do anything that hurts you, but you do things that you enjoy and you do it without any guilt. And you don't have any problems like that to worry about. But what it says is without the desire is I react to that which prompts me from the inside. I have no desire any longer to lead my life or to direct my life or to have any human being directed. I want my life directed by the Christ who dwells within me, who sits at the right hand, which means who sits at the right hemisphere of the brain. And the information that comes will not lead me into trouble and will just lift me up and lift me up. And it's there for each one of us. So let us overcome. Let's tell the king of Sodom to stick all of his physical stuff. He's not getting anything. Let's offer to give the 10%, which is the left side in meditation. Let Melchizedek open the gate to the right side and let us stroll into nirvana and let us together overcome and be lifted up by the power of this blessed Christ who dwells within us. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing this time uh, in our studies of Abraham, Abraham, and Sarah. And uh, we'll go on with it the next time we see you. Bye-bye.